very happy to be able to be back here at Tim's after a three-year period. As was just said, the last time I was here was February, right at the beginning. It was actually during this initial period of coronavirus spreading both throughout the world and in Malaysia. Bante just checked with me. Actually, was it me that brought it to Taiping that night? So I'm not sure. There were some people who drove up from Johor. I think it was them. So... But that was it, you know. They remember that was early days, and then within a month, within three weeks, as we know it, the world had changed completely. Our lives changed forever. We experienced a whole new situation. That night, there was a bit nerves around. We knew there was something going on. We were hearing that you shouldn't be traveling too much, but no one at that stage was really daring or wanting to take the initiative to just cancel events. That was, you know, because we're a bit like sheep. We wait for somebody else to make the first move. It would be seen as a bit too hyper paranoid to just say, "Okay, cancel everything." But there was this palpable feeling of slight, the fear and the anxiety of the unknown. And we didn't know what it was deep down. We all say, "Ah, never mind lah," but we don't really know. And so, three years later, I don't need to go through what happened. You will know probably more than me because I went back at that stage. Three weeks later, twelfth of March, I went back to Thailand, seeing that things were changing, and I had a sense that soon there might be closures between countries. I flew back to Thailand. It was very strange going to KLIA, absolutely empty, literally on the plane Thai Airways to Bangkok. There was about ten passengers. So the world was already there was no lockdowns. Everything was open, but no one was traveling yet. Arrived in Suwarnapum, Bangkok Airport, empty, really quite creepy. And the lay disciple picked me up in his car. We drove from there to a branch monastery, Ajahn Piak, one of our senior ajans. The drive usually takes like forty-five minutes to one hour, but this twenty minutes, empty motorway. It really felt like being in a movie. So anyway, after that, I went to the Forest Hermitage where I stay in Kanchanaburi Province on the Burmese border, and that was absolutely normal. Once you're in the jungle in the forest, everything's normal again. No COVID, coronavirus, no lockdowns, no nothing. So we live our life is a bit like not quite lockdown, but we as because we're very fortunate, and that this is the chance we have and the choice we've made. To step back from family life, business, traveling, holidays, and so we're able just to simply adapt to the external conditions, the social changes, and adapt, but keep going with our Dhamma Vinaya life. And in fact, for myself, it was just a wonderful three years. It, it feels bad, or you're almost guilty to say I had a great COVID three years. I was able to do what I've been thinking: How can I do this for so long? Which is to stop traveling. To stay in one place, stay in the forest that I love, and not have all these visitors coming to see me, not have any invitations, and just do my little dhamma vinaya practice, like be a forest monk, just a Mr. Nobody in the forest with the animals and the gibbons and the sunrise, sunset, just day after day monotony, which is really conducive towards this holy life. And Thailand actually had a relatively, I would say. You know, a good. I was very fortunate there. First year was very few, very minor kind of uh, incidents of COVID in the country. The second year, you know, a bit of a wave at some point. So there was a little bit of traveling, and when people could, things got back to normal. And there were some sangha events, but it was considered quite normal to say, "Actually, I don't want to travel right now. Just wait and see. Wait until things are really safe." So I took that advantage, and it was true. I just wasn't in the mood to travel, and I didn't see why. When I'm in a safe place, put myself at risk for what? Just to sit like this and you know enjoy some kind of uh, event, katina, or you know inaugurating another building or something. No need, right? So it was very nice. The key point is that, at least for myself, and I've spoken to many people, it was a time to return to. Get back to basics and to ask ourselves what is important in life. What is a priority? What is a necessity? And what is a desire? And to be honest, what is frankly a complete waste of time of all our activities? And we're beginning to be able to see with a bit of clarity what is 
definitely those things which are a bit of a waste of time and realize, yeah, we can do without those, we learn to live without those and actually we're even happier without those things. Then what are our desires, what are the things we like doing, so okay, we'll keep, when we can, we'll, we'll do some of those again, we're looking forward to that. But again, with a, hopefully a slightly different perspective. And then those things which are priorities, which a lot of people got back into health, got into some kind of spirituality. People spent time with families, people spent time with themselves, people took up hobbies again, reading or whatever and things. Or going on walks, if you're allowed out, you could go for a walk, reconnect with nature. And realized, yeah, this is really important to my wellness or my well-being. So it was a tragic time for many people. But, you know, the spirit of the Dharma is that any challenges we have, no matter how difficult it is, our task or our challenge is to find something good in that. What can we learn from that? Because nothing is intrinsically good or bad. It's ultimately about how do we respond to it or do we suffer over it? Do we experience happiness over it? And what can we learn from it? So then coming back now with a much more you know, normal kind of situation, it, of course it does feel nice, it is a relief. And it is nice to be doing things again, but certainly with a, hopefully with a sense of caution now. I've been visiting my father, haven't seen him for three years, the longest period in my life, not seeing parents, quite a long time. But it was a good break, good to get a step back from all my family. Again, to turn inwards and not to travel. And then reconnecting is very nice again and have new different perspectives. Time has passed so we don't do things in such a perfunctory way, more or less not in a routine way. Everything is precious now. And of course, if we talk about the Buddhist teachings, then why is this simple truth of old age, sickness and death, why is that such an important one? Why is that something which traditionally was, has always been in a more legendary way, the story behind the Buddhas going forth. Everyone will know the story in some form or other, but some different version or other, that the Buddha left his palace, decided to go for a drive with his charioteer, and for the first time in his life saw an old person, because on all previous occasions, any time he set forth from the palace, the, his father, the king, would have the roads cleaned, and anything unsightly would be swept away, and banners would be hung, and it would be, look very beautiful. So this time, though, he snuck out, so no time for preparations. And he saw an old man, and he asked his charioteer, Channa, what's that? Channa said, my lord, it's an old man. And he just said, that looks disgusting. Well, I hope I never end up in that state. And of course, Channa said, my lord, all people, you and I, must one day reach the state of old age. And the Buddha was completely knocked over by that and deeply distressed by that thought and asked Chana to take him back to the palace before he fainted and then took a few weeks or months to get over the shock before daring to venture out again at which occasion he saw a sick man being carried or being helped or being tended to by the side of the road perhaps with sores perhaps with blood some kind of and was again disgusted by what seemed to be a person but couldn't quite figure out what kind of person that was and he asked Channa again, Channa, what's that? Channa said, my lord, it's a sick man. And Buddha said, well, Channa, please reassure me that I will never reach that sort of state in my life. And Channa had to say, my lord, uh, all men and women born must reach this stage of old age and sickness, you and I must one day succumb to such a state. And again, the Buddha was devastated, um, close to fainting. It's kind of a, oh dear, kind of a young prince, a bit delicate. Take me home, take me home. I, this is too much. And drive home and recuperate for the next few weeks before getting the strength to. So of course, this is like another version of the story. You see how, you see how the suttas develop. <laughs> The, the legends or the stories. And then on the third visit, saw a, a group of people carrying what seemed to be some kind of table with a white cloth draped over it and something under the white cloth. So he said, Channa, what's that? 
and they were weeping and wailing and some of their clothes were wet. I said, my Lord, that is a, a group of mourners, uh, family members of a man who is now dead, carrying out the funeral rites and uh, weeping and wailing, distressed on account of his departure. And he said, oh, that's terrible. What poor people feel so far from so sorry for them and surely myself I, w I won't ever reach that kind of advanced stage or appalling stage of existence and of course Chandna said my lord all of us you too myself having been born must not only age get sick but one day die so again this uh, shocking truth uh, knocked the poor prince over De so, so delicate had his upbringing been and then finally the fourth trip he sees a summoner a monk, some kind of religious renunciate, religious seeker, samana, an ascetic, having left the home life, having shaved off his hair and beard, having put on some kind of uh, brown robe or religious garment, simple cloth, sitting meditating under a tree or maybe just walking quietly, eyes downcast, inwardly restrained, contemplating the truth of the world. And so the Buddha was struck by his demeanor, his calm, his energy, his peace, and overcome by a sense of wonder and awe, and asked Channa, what's that? Channa said, that, my lord, is a renunciant, somebody who has left behind this material world and society and is seeking the answers to the questions regarding life and death and the universe, something like that. And the Buddha was just filled with a sense of marvel, relief, mystery, and deep longing. At last, perhaps the answers to these questions could be found. So this is the legendary story. In fact, this story does come up in the suttas regarding another Buddha, the Buddha Vipassi. The Buddha never tells it directly regarding himself, Gotama Buddha, but it's a wonderful story. And in the Buddha's teachings, of course, he uses the, the concept of aging, sickness and death as something which would stir us up to seek that which is uh, truly important. And the famous example in the suttas, again, to go through the same story, but in another version, very different version, but the same essence, the Buddha gives the simile to a king. The king comes to the Buddha and, and the Buddha says, you know, great king, what would you, if a messenger were to come from the north, or probably the east, the east is usually the first direction, saying, great king, there is a mountain, one yojana, yojana is, so they call it roughly 10 miles or 15 kilometers, a mountain, one yojana wide and one yojana deep and one yojana high. So imagine a pyramid, a pyramid 15 kilometers high, 15 kilometers around the base, square base, uh, every side, bearing down on our kingdom. So somehow it's a mountain traveling along the ground, eliminating, totally obliterating, destroying everything in its path. That man were to come to you from the east and say, my lord, there is this mountain bearing down on the kingdom. Do what you see fit. Mm. What would you see fit to do? And this king said, I would see fit to do, to keep the precepts and live a life of, of wholesomeness and do good deeds. And the Buddha said, and then if a man were to come for you, suppose a man were to come from the southern direction saying, my lord, I must inform you that there is a mountain, a yojana high, a yojana wide, a yojana deep, bearing down upon us, destroying, eliminating, obliterating everything in its path. Do now as you see fit, great king. What would you do? The king said, well, what else could I do? I just keep the precepts, live a righteous life and do good acts. And if a man were to come from the west, from the north, saying, great king, there's a mountain, a yojana high, a yojana wide, a yojana deep, bearing down upon us, destroying everything in its path, do now as you see fit. What would you do, great king? And the king said, indeed, I would do the same thing. I would, there's only the keeping of precepts, living a virtuous life and carrying out wholesome acts. So the Buddha said, in, in the same way, great king, you know, birth, old age, sickness and death are bearing down on all of us, destroying all of us, everything, eating up everything in their path. 
So now all that's really important or left to do is to fulfill the precepts, which means lead a virtuous or an ethical life, live a wholesome life, do wholesome actions. And it's true, isn't it? I mean, really speaking, what else matters? I mean, literally nothing matters anymore, does it, in that context? And so the Buddha used the, um, the imagery of old age, sickness and death again and again and again. And actually when he referred to his own going forth, a very clearest passage where he talks about why he left the palace, why he left the home life, why he sought a spiritual life, it's very simple, again, same idea, different language. He said, I considered, why should I myself subject to birth, aging, sickness, death, decay and defilement, seek that which is also subject to birth, aging, sickness, death and defilement? And then he said, and what is subject to birth, aging, sickness, death and defilement? The answer is wives and children, men and women, slaves, horses, cattle, mares, sheep, fowl, pigs, gold and silver, land. So basically the material realm, these things are inevitably bound up with uh, change, decay, separation. So why should we seek those things? They will never fulfill us. So there's no answer at that stage. But he then went on to say, suppose I seek the unsurpassed supreme liberation from bondage, Nibbana. That means, suppose I seek, seeing as I'm tied up, I'm like in prison, or I'm tied up, or I'm lost, seeking things which will one day leave me disappointed, and even myself, my own life, will leave me unfulfilled. It's like somebody who's lost or who's imprisoned in a, in a maze, wandering around in circles, he said, should, I should seek this unsurpassed, so the, the supreme liberation, Nibbana. And again, at that stage, she's basically still a young man, wondering what to do, not really understanding yet, what does this mean, but clearly a term he'd heard, or this idea in, in Indian culture of a freedom. And it's something we can all relate to. So we don't need to get into philosophical discussions now about what is Nibbana and if everything's not self, who goes there? That's not really what we want to do. What we want to do is, is feel for ourselves that part of our lives where there's dukkha, where there's tension, where there's a sense of not being free. And ask ourselves, how do I find that peace? How do I find that freedom? How do I find that? And ultimately what it's about is about that happiness and that joy and that sense of well-being that we all that we all want. And so that's why, you know, it's so so important to understand the, the value of of the simple going to refuge in the triple gem when you say Buddhang Sarananga Chami, Dhammang Sarananga Chami, Sangang Sarananga Chami. What you're saying is I'm now taking on a set of values, a set of principles, a perspective, which I believe, we can't prove it yet, which I believe will be freeing to me, which will bring me ease and happiness and joy. And I say we can't prove it ultimately, but we can begin to prove it by seeing it bit by bit by bit. So when you do live a virtuous, righteous life, and when you do keep the precepts, when you do train in wholesomeness, generosity, and more than that, for example, when you train yourselves in metta, loving kindness, and have compassion for seeing other people suffering, and joy when they have joy, but ultimately develop equanimity, which is a, a state of mind which is more even, more free, when you know that ultimately you can't control the world, that everything is arising based on causes and conditions and causes and conditions and it's been going on for hundreds and thousands and millions of years and those causes and conditions are so, so innumerable and just so impossible to count. Like the weather, can you predict, 
Can you predict which drop of rain will fall first from a cloud? Maybe, you know, it happens, but who can predict that? And that's like, that's like the way the world works. Can you predict where a grain of sand will land if, or will end up in a hundred years if you, if you throw it into the sea? It's beyond us. So we can let go. But there's one thing we can do is live a life, our own little life, in a virtuous, wholesome way. And in that way, experience the benefits. This much you can prove to yourself. And there's still no guarantee. Sometimes you do the good things, and then something happens and you feel miserable. It's not a guarantee. This isn't like buying happiness. You know, you don't say, I, I paid with my five precepts, now where's my happiness? I did dana this morning, why am I angry this evening? Right? It doesn't work quite like that. Not that simple. But it's the overall principle that we trust in. And we, over enough time, if we give it enough of a period to observe, and enough of a kind of sample, it's like doing a survey. If your survey sample is broad enough, then you get a, a good overall picture. Yeah? If you ask 10 people, you may not quite but if you ask a thousand people or ten thousand people, then you will get a good sense of, of what people think or the general opinion. So it's the same with looking at investigating, and does this karma really work? Do good things really bring good results? If you look too short term, you can't see it. So this is the role of faith. Have the faith to, to practice day in, day out, day in, day out, and very, very consistently, which is not easy. Remember, it's like fitness. If you if you do your fitness training, but you do it one day a week, or you do three days in a row, and then you leave it for three days, and then you do another day, and then you leave it for three days, it's not quite going to be as good as doing it every day, every day, every day, every day. And you may not see the results. Or if you do some fitness, but then you have some, whatever, chocolate cake in the evening, then it's like one step forward, one step backwards or a bit of fitness in the morning and you can't, but you don't want to quit smoking. It's very simple, isn't it? So, so you have to basically have a consistent approach. So that's why dana and sila have to go together. It's not enough just to do in Thai, they're very good at that. They love dana, but they don't like the sila part. And they even do the merit in order, they say langbap, to wash away the, the unwholesome karma with the, with the generosity, with the monks. It doesn't work that way. Obviously it might help a little bit, but it doesn't really work because they really go together, Adana and Sila. And in fact, Lung Po Cha, he, one very nice uh, teaching, he said, abandoning the unwholesome is more important than doing the wholesome. And so in terms of Dana and Sila, Sila is abandoning the unwholesome. That's why we start say in the evening we start with giving the precepts. Now of course sometimes you start with dana, some lists start with dana, like dana, sila, bhavana, practice. But actually in terms of what's really important, it's really important to abandon that which is unwholesome. Imagine you're trying to sort of maybe uh, clean, you know, imagine you you're trying to clean something, uh, something like a very old, old cup, which is very, very dirty. It's got some thick stains on the outside. So the first, you want to first clean the cup and then make it, you know, really, really clean or hygienic. So if it has these coffee stains on the outside or something like that, the first thing you've got to do is get rid of those coffee stains. That's the unwholesome thing. You have to do that first. And then once it's clean, maybe, spray it with some kind of, you know, sanitizer so that it's really free of any germs. You don't spray the sanitizer first, you see, because you've got to work, you've got to get rid of the unwholesome stuff first. And actually, once you get rid of the unwholesome stuff, it's already quite clean. So just to eliminate the unwholesome things from our lives already is a very, very good start. We're, we're intrinsically, you know, good people. The mind is, is a good tool. Happiness is there. We just have to 
work at eliminating the unhappiness, the unwholesome states of mind. But then we can also make it even better with dana, with bhavana, with mental training, the meditation side, right speech. So, everything I'm saying, I really hope you have heard before. Usually, people try not to be repetitive and say, I don't want to repeat myself, but actually in Dhamma, repetition is good. And it's good to hear talks again and again and again on, on the same theme, maybe in different ways, different, different speaker, different Dhamma center. But basically, you know, it doesn't change very much because the Buddha taught, as we know, he taught the middle way, the Eightfold Path, generosity, sila, meditation. Now people are interested and aware about meditation. In the past, they haven't been so aware of it, you know, lay people necessarily. But the key is really the, uh, the right lifestyle. And hearing it again and again helps because the stream of our minds and the stream of society takes us away from these simple principles. I mean, it shouldn't be that difficult, should it? Just the five precepts, right speech, half an hour meditation in the morning, half an hour meditation in the evening. You know, everybody can eat, everybody can bathe, everybody can have a nice time with their families. But, the, you know, things like the precepts and the meditation often falls off, off the radar. You don't have enough time or the pressure to, for example, lie or the pressure to you know, can be social pressure, some people to drink. It's very difficult to just really keep as the principles that you really have to keep up. So these reminders, as well as coming to a, a monastery or a, or a center where there are monks living, these reminders are very powerful because we need them. It's just like pulling up your socks as you go, as you run around, you know, football players or when you're a kid, remember you run around and your socks just fall down, you know, from you pull them up here and then they just fall down until they're around your ankles. And so, teacher or parents always saying, you know, pull your socks up. And it's an expression, isn't it, in English? You've got to pull your socks up. And so it's normal. It's normal. So that's kind of what coming to hear a Dharma talk is about. We're kind of, kind of emotionally or spiritually pulling our socks up, being reminded. And also having fun. It's about community, uh, feeling like you're coming to spend time in a wholesome way, in a good way, you know, rather than going out or watching TV or you get like one hour, one and a half hours not using your telephones these days. Yeah, it's good. People who are stressed can get a break, get away from the kids, get away from the parents, the husband, the wife, whatever. Or just sit quietly. And just sit quietly and experience the simple truth of life and be okay with that, that we're living, breathing, in and out. Very nice, there's no problems right here, right now. It's not nice, especially nice in a sensual way, it's just basically problem free. What I'm saying, this Dhamma talk, I'm, I'll be honest with you, it's not particularly interesting. <laughs> it's just the simple truth. But it's kind of nice because it's not harmful or, or bothersome. And we think about old age, sickness, death, and rather than being fearful or something to push away, it's nice. Why is it nice? Because it's true. We really, in life, we're seeking that which is true. I mean, if you want a friend, you want a friend who's going to be truthful. If you want to watch an advert, you would want that advert to be true. I don't know if there are any adverts which are genuinely true, but... You know, that's ideally what you would like. If you hear a story from somebody, you would want them to be telling you a true story unless, unless you know, it's just a story. So truthfulness is what we really want because it, it means something. Truthfulness is, means something because it's important. And so we're looking for meaning. Well, we we'll just look for what's true. So old age, sickness and death, and the truth that that is what lies within us, you know. If I were to say to you, what can you be sure about? You know, we're seeking certainty in life. Everyone wants to find certainty, all right? So, what can you be really sure about? Yeah, 
that I'm going to get old and die. You see? So there we are, we found certainty. You see, you can say, wow, I, I was wavering when I came in, now I'm sure. <laughs> see? So we're getting somewhere in a very simple way. And it's, it, there's a sense of relief. And we know, yeah, we have to let go of our parents. We have to let go of our loved ones. We have to let go of ourselves, our dreams, our, our hopes for the future. Not because they're wrong or bad, but because ultimately they will go. So what are you going to do? Like hold on and try and force it to be different? You can try, but you will suffer and the people around you will suffer. So the Buddha's message was always very simple. He said in Pali, it goes, Dukkhan ceva panyape mi dukkasa chanirodhang. Um, and before that, he says, so I, I teach only about suffering and the ending of suffering, or the non-arising of suffering, how to prevent suffering from arising. And at that time, he said, Bubbe cha hang etarhicha, which means in the past and now, I teach only about suffering and the non-arising of suffering. So the point was very, very clear. There's only really one, if you like, Buddhist teaching or the heart of the Buddhist teaching. And it's so important for us to, to keep that in mind or never to let that drift away from our vision or from our hearts that the Buddha is really teaching about an individual, that's our own individual movement towards happiness, which is there when the suffering passes. And this is his teaching. Everything that he taught is about fostering that feeling. Mm. There's nothing else he said, I'm not teaching about. So the Buddha was the doctor to cure mental dukkha, not to, not to sort out any other problem and not to sort out anyone apart from oneself. And that helps keep it very simple and that's a real relief. And so now we can put the, the teaching into action or take the Buddha's medicine and again come back to, okay, so what did he teach? He taught us to be generous, to keep the precepts, to train in uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood, to understand what's wholesome and unwholesome, state of mind, greed, hatred, delusion is unwholesome root. Root means that that which gives rise to dukkha. So we can define very clearly for ourselves what is wholesome. We'll always come somehow with or based on greed, craving, desire, or anger, negativity, and just general delusion, foolishness, and not understanding. And the Buddha defined what delusion is, but again, it's quite technical. We don't always need to go into the technical details. We know, and we're talking generally, the delusion basically means when you, when you don't see something clearly, you, when you don't get it right, when you misperceive something, misunderstand something. So in life, the important number one right view is that good things, good actions, of body, speech, and mind will bring good results. We never let go of that principle we can train in meditation, we can train in being generous or, or having, cultivating the states of loving kindness, compassion, joy and equanimity. Trying to bring on a feeling of equanimous means when you're not emotionally moved or swayed. Swayed means pushed around, rocking and shaking by things. A sense of looking on from above, aloof. You have a sense of freedom as I come back to this. We're looking for a kind of freedom. We're looking for a kind of release. We're looking for a kind of ease. So that comes and you come here, you breathe in, you breathe out. Right here, right now, everything's okay. And as I said, it's not because this is a nice, special, fantastic experience. It's because it's just okay. Quite simple. But we're able to drop the dukkha, drop the thinking and the wanting and the not liking and the 
thoughts of the past and the thoughts of the future. And then suddenly everything's okay. You know? What's the problem right now? And try to take that into our daily lives and to cultivate that, that feeling. There are all these issues, but you don't have to make a problem out of it. No one, no person, no thing can force you to suffer if you don't create that suffering inside you. And that's a very high standard, but that's, that's the, the teaching, the message of the Buddha. He teaches the way to be free from suffering. Uh, he teaches the way for you, or for each of us, to train our minds, to re, reconfigure or reboot or re, whatever, you know, re, rewire or develop new perspectives so that we no longer suffer over, over the same old things. So it's a path of taking responsibility, neither blaming somebody for your dukkha, nor looking outside to bring you happiness. So we're not making offerings to spirits, we're not coming to get you know, blessings from monks or even lucky numbers or anything like that. It just doesn't work. <laughs> We've tried it, <laughs> doesn't work. So we say, okay, I'll, I'll sort it out for myself. And that's in line with, with life in general, isn't it? You know, basically, if you want something done properly, you've got to do it yourself. If you've got a family problem, the family has to work it out. If you've got dukkha inside your heart or mind, you've got to sort it out for yourself. The body works on its own. If you eat food, you've got to go to the toilet for yourself. No one can do it for you. So, this is very simple. For me, words of Dhamma, but in a way very profound. I know for myself, it's changed my uh, perspective on, on life and the world. I was very lucky to come to encounter this Dhamma at the age of 18. And... It just made such good sense. I could see that the world, life was bound up with all this material search, all this craving, all this amazing things that you could do with life. But at the end of the day, you ask yourself, well, what's it all for? What's it all for? Pursuing some kind of happiness, which is so obvious that it will be elusive. Just when you think you've got it, it just jumps away a little bit. And so luckily, on hearing the Dhamma's teaching, myself and I'm sure all of you, something inside you click, clicks, something says, yes, this is right. I've got, to, uh, I've got to take on these principles and find my happiness. Mm. Because the world won't find it for you or the world won't bring it to you. And it's an amazing thought. You can just breathe in and breathe out and feel contented and feel free and feel at ease and not have to go and do something or be someone or change yourself. You can be happy with your body, you can be happy with how you look, you can be happy with your situation, you can be happy and that means, means not judging or not, not suffering over it, accepting, just really the way it is. So you've heard all of these kind of expressions, all of these uh, words. It's just a question of really, in a way, believing it enough to then keep coming back to the practice, doing the practice, seeing, okay, if things arise and pass away, what does that mean? That means you have to let go of them. It means there's no point craving them. Beyond food for the day, clothing to cover your body, a place to spend the night, and medicine when you're sick, everything else is extra. If you have family, of course, you have to look after your family in, in the same way. Make sure they have food, make sure they have clothing, make sure they have medicine. So everything is extra. Okay, you have jobs, you have to do that well for the purpose of life. But anything beyond that is extra. And when you're very clear on that, 
then it helps uh, it helps find what's the difference in between essential and what's non-essential and the Buddha always taught us to let go of that which is non-essential people who constantly seek that which is non-essential or think things which are non-essential are essential they will never reach what Buddha called the essence they will never reach the the heart of the matter so uh, today really what I want to say is in, in a very simple way invite or ask everybody to keep thinking in your life like a reminder keep asking yourself what is really important what are the values that I hold that are really important never let go of those what are the principles what are the ways of acting body speech and mind which are important uh, never let go of those never let society uh, push you in the wrong direction if you have family work situation which is difficult unwholesome then be very very careful you may have to make changes in your life don't feel that your duty as a dutiful son or a dutiful mother or parent or husband or wife is to just constantly support a relative in an unwholesome unwholesome action or put yourself in a situation where you're always feeling pain or feeling you're somebody's punch bag or, or always experiencing uh, dukkha find your freedom get your space be able to say yeah my happiness is worth worth more than simply playing a role and doing the right what I think is the right thing is very challenging make changes in your life you can change age 40 50 60 70 80 make changes in your life you'll be happier the people around you will be happier and ultimately this is the growth in Dhamma so I think I've said a lot already again it should be old stuff nothing new tonight nothing very interesting bit boring but I think you know relevant or important these things mean a lot to me as a bhikkhu lay person it's not that different because we're all basically bound up with aging sickness and death so our priorities are the same we all have that same mountain or four mountains bearing down on us from the east south west and north so our responsibility is the same to fulfill the precepts live a life of morality cultivate wholesomeness and do good actions that's the only thing to do and what comes of it we'll see so I'll end there for this evening and maybe have some time now open it up if some people would like to ask some questions maybe based on something I said maybe totally different topic um, then feel free to ask some questions we have some time